our scripture reading is the same as last week um, because it's so packed, it's so filled, um, and it has a particular weighty history to it. If you guys know the scripture that uh, we read last week, we're going to read it again here this morning, but uh, there's a, a long and storied history of misinterpretation and abuse and trauma with our text this morning. Yay! <laughs> So we're going to address it again this week and uh, follow up with it um, to see if we can get even deeper. So here we go. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 through 33. It really kicks off with a bang here. Wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the church his body, and is himself its savior. Just as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her in order to make her holy by cleansing her with washing water by his word, by the word, so as to present the church to himself in splendor, without a spot or a wrinkle or anything of the kind, so that she may be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hates his own flesh, but he nourishes and tenderly cares for it, just as Christ does for the church because we are members of his bodies. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I am speaking about Christ and the church. Each of you, however, should love his wife as himself, and wives, and a wife should respect her husband. This is the word of the Lord. Oh, well, that was a little bit more gusto than I thought. <laughs> I thought we'd be like, this is the word of the Lord. Three, two, one. Uh, church, what a time to be preaching this text. What a time. What a time. Uh, <laughs> and of course, Paul and I decided to, to dive deep down. We, we doubled down on this one specific test because we're smart. <laughs> smart guys. On this week of all weeks, right on the on the tail end of the overturning of Roe v. Wade, right? Oh, man. So you, so you can show up and listen to two more white guys tell you about this particular text of the Bible. Oh, man, what a week to preach on this text. It's as if there's someone else who has something going on here. It goes without saying, though, uh, but I'm going to say it anyways, that this specific text uh, has been wildly, wildly misappropriated throughout the centuries. It's actually kind of crazy that I can say centuries with remarkable accuracy uh, because the, uh, these verses in the Bible have been misappropriated and misinterpreted and, and have been the source of so much trauma and hurt and pain for literally hundreds of years. And that makes me very, very very sad. Obviously, out of the 11 verses that I just read, the first half of the first verse brings with it the most weight, Ephesians 5, 22. Wives, be subject to your husbands. Has been the idea that carries with it so much pain and abuse and sorrow. Yet, in this text, there are so many pieces at play. It's not just that. There's so many pieces at play. And unfortunately for women throughout history, they have suffered from these various pieces uh, being used as, as bludgeons across generations. It's not just you and the pain that you've carried. Generations of the women of our own ancestry have been bludgeoned by these verses. This text is about husbands and it's about wives. It's also about pride and submission. And sacrifice. This text is about leadership and power. There's so much in these words. And today we're going to dive specifically in to the aspect uh, of leadership and the power dynamics involved in, 
Ephesians text. Last week, Paul did a really good job of outlining the mystery around marriage and the miracle that marriage is, mainly because uh, of the difficulty of bringing two prides together in union. We humans are truly fallen creatures because our prides, our self-absorbed little egos, desire for entire worlds and solar systems to revolve around us. So uniting two prides together in marriage is no small feat. Huzzah! <laughs> he also talked about how within the confines of Christian marriage, there's a third aspect involved, a third person involved, and that's God. And because there's this third person involved within this covenant, a covenant of Christian marriage, uh, ends up looking a lot like the Trinity. Three persons constantly pouring into one another, pouring love and gratitude and wisdom and mercy and strength and courage, adoration and submission, constantly pouring into one another. Most readers read the text that I just read and reduce it to its most basic and reductionistic and maybe unintelligible form. And they take it in the direction of wives and husbands and, and their marriage. However, we wanted to dive a little bit deeper and highlight the more intricate nuances of the text. Last week, Paul talked about marriages and prides. This week, I'm going to talk about leadership and submission. Here's the thing about patriarchy. I do not believe God intended the world that we live in to be run by patriarchy. I do not believe the Bible argues for that either, although the Bible has documents a history of people who have been run by patriarchy. Unfortunately for us, we read that Bible and we're like, well, we should do everything that they did. I also disagree with that. Many of them had many, many wives, and that was not a good idea. <laughs> The family dynamics involved, just horrid. Yet many of us come into the era that we're in right now, uh, and, and many of us uh, come from the era where mainstream Christianity was a blended version of like evangelicalism and conservatism, which means we had a steady, steady diet um, of, of men are rulers and leaders simply because they are men. And this is something that is ingrained in our brains and in our societies around the world, not just here in America, and in our cultures. It's just something we've, we've carried with us for generations. And as a student of leadership and as a leadership consultant and uh, someone who walks alongside churches and businesses, I can tell you that leadership has nothing to do with gender. Nothing to do with gender. I remember I was leading a church through a transition and they were in the process of electing new elders. And there were three candidates, two of them perfectly capable people. But one of them was a wildly immature and dysfunctional guy in his late 40s. I sat with the, ses the session uh, of elders and I sat with the, the other pastor uh, and consultant that I was working with and I sat with the executive presbyter of the presbytery. And I strongly recommended do not ordain this specific individual to be an elder of the church. He's not ready. He is not able. He's not equipped to be able to handle, handle the demands of that leadership role. What he was, was available, and he was interested, and he was willing to serve. He was a guy. Long story short, they ordained him. And over the next year, he verbally assaulted a couple congregants. He, on several occasions, several, several occasions, mostly assaulted, verbally assaulted me, uh, and an employee that also worked for the church, resulting in a several hundred thousand dollar lawsuit for the church and the presbytery. Yay! Moral of the story, being a leader requires a lot more than simply being a guy. Amen? It's a lot more than that. And it's also a lot more than just being available or being interested or being willing to serve. It's not enough. Often the best leaders, interestingly enough, are those who are disinterested in being leaders. Which leads me 
to outline what leadership actually is. Many people think leadership is authority. It is not. Police have authority. Hall monitors have authority. Shoot, even stop signs have authority. They tell you when to stop. That doesn't make you a leader, right? A lot of people think power is leadership. It is not. A guy with a gun has power over you. Your boss has power over you. He can tell you whether you're showing up to work tomorrow or not, right? Your parents have power over you. He can tell you whether you're going to your room or not. But none of those things make them leaders. What leadership actually is, believe it or not, is influence. The ability to influence another so that they voluntarily follow you. True leadership inspires people to want to follow, to obey, or to submit or subject. Forcing someone to do something because of your power or authority is not leadership. That's coercion. That's violence. Inspiring others to do something with your influence is leadership, which means when you move, people want to move after you or move with you. When you speak, people want to pay attention. When you choose, your choices affect the choices of those around you. Your opinions affect the opinions of those around you. This is why we hold leaders in such high esteem. We hold leaders to higher degrees of responsibility and accountability for their actions, words, and deeds. I had an interesting conversation this week with a friend of mine, Nick, and he has a great uh, digital presence and uh, a podcast, and it's called Let's Give a Damn. Uh, he posted a news report of a pastor this week who was arrested for masturbating outside of a Starbucks and generally had a comment of, pastors kind of suck, right? Uh, we end up, then we ended up having a conversation about that. <laughs> and I was uh, confronted with some assumptions of mine that I had held. First off, I do agree with him, pastors do kind of suck, me included. <laughs> but mostly, I was confronted with the assumption that I had uh, around the vast majority of pastors and how they do quiet, good work for the congregations and the communities that they serve. The vast majority of pastors across the world, you've never heard about, and you never will, because there is no breaking news when you do your job. No one is writing home to their mom or their dad when the Uber takes you to where you wanna go. They just did their job. That's what we kind of expect them to do. No one gets the plate of food when they order a plate of food and you're like, Mom, you wouldn't believe it. We expect people to do their job. So no one is shocked when a pastor does their job. However, there's such weight and, and history and substantive meaning behind the word and position and title of pastor. When you have that title placed upon you, you have a bunch of very lofty expectations put upon you. And that means when you do horrible things outside of a Starbucks, you make the news, right? But here's the thing, church. It's not just pastors. It's leaders. We expect exceptional qualities and behaviors from our leaders, pastors. Husbands, mothers, bosses, CEOs, governors, Supreme Court justices, senators, congressmen, presidents. We accept exceptionality. We expect exceptionality. Half of this country was losing their mind over our last president. And now half of the other country is losing their mind of our current president. We expect our leaders to walk, talk, behave, perform exceptionally. And those exceptions, when those exceptions are not met, people will let you know. Trust me, I'm not your conventional, run-of-the-mill, normal pastor. 
and I have the emails to prove it. Some of you have read my signs out there. <laughs> but church, this is a deeply ingrained belief in us, and it's not something uh, that we're necessarily taught either. This is like a, a tribal nature part of our being. This is a, a social creature that we are, part of us. There is a social contract between the group and the leader. This general contract says that the leader gets the first fruits, gets the first piece of meat from the hunt, gets the first choice of mate, of a distinguished position in the society. The buck stops with them. They get to make the final decision. The trick is the leader is also the first to lead the hunt, the first to lead the war party, the first to enter the battle the first one to sacrifice themselves for the benefit of the group. This is a fundamental contract. It's a social contract that we all kind of assume, kind of have in the back of our brains when we enter into a leadership follower dynamic. We all have this. We, the group, say to you, the leader, you get first pick. But you, the leader, will be the first one to sacrifice for us, for the, for the benefit of the whole group. Let's all, let's bring this knowledge back to our text today. It says, wives, submit to your husbands. Now me, personally, I'm not too committed to the idea of men and men only being the leaders in their family unit. I was actually raised by my mom, uh, who was a remarkable leader of our family unit. She did a amazing job, mainly because she sacrificed herself a lot, and we could see it, and we knew it. But whoever is the leader in your family unit, or in your workplace environment, or in your church congregations, both parties involved, both the group and the leader, would be wise to uphold their end of the social contract, which means the group would be wise to submit to the leader. I don't know if you've ever worked with the group of people where everyone wants to go in different directions. Have you ever worked in a group and you're like, let's go this way. If you've ever played on a team that doesn't work together, uh, they don't get very far. Teams that don't work together don't win games. However, even if you don't agree in the direction that the group is headed, if the group comes together and works together, they will get 10 times further. I guarantee you they will get further. Church, we as a congregation here at West Press, or take it away from West Press, any group, any team, any company looking to accomplish a real goal, you're going to get 10 times further if you work together rather than divided. And that has a lot of implications for our society today. Amen? Church, our prides, our self-absorbed little egos, want to go their own way. Yet, it is with our submission to our leaders that enables us to get somewhere. And if a basic argument about the benefits of teamwork doesn't work for you, and uh, how submission is actually a virtue, I submit to you, Exhibit B, the person of Jesus the greatest leader that ever lived. The structure of patriarchy is built on a system of violence and coercion to protect and insulate its own authority and position and power. It will do anything it can to retain that position and power. Jesus, on the other hand, submits his will to the will of God over and above his own, which includes submitting his own life to death so that the greater group might live. It is through submission, not violence or coercion. Remember, the king of kings, the creator of the universe, led through submission, not violence or coercion. It's that leader, the greatest leader who ever lived. That's how he chose to lead. Our text also says, husbands, 
Love your wives, which is to say, leaders, love your subjects, love your group. And when the Apostle Paul, and then, and then he dives into what that exactly means, he spends kind of a long time doing it. He doesn't say, love is being kind, and it's delivering good speeches, and it's saying nice words, and it's making nice promises, and it's paying the bills, and it's uh, being the disciplinary with your children so you don't have to be. And it's uh, providing a house and clothing and food on the table. He doesn't say any of that to the husbands or the leader of the household or of the group. He says, leaders, love your subjects the way that Christ loved the church and gave himself up. He basically says, leaders, always be ready at a moment's notice to die for your people. Be the first one to step up. Be the first one to submit your life for the benefit of the group. Don't you see, church? Submission is not some bludgeon to be used to control and manipulate people into submission or subjection or, or obedience. Submission is integral to the group because uplifting the goal of the group, the bigger, the greater group, in its obedience to its in its obedience to its leader actually gets the group somewhere it's that teamwork if you work together you get somewhere you get to your goals you get from where you were at to where you were going and submission is also integral for the leader because they are constantly subordinating their own will their own pride their own personal benefit safety for the benefit, the greater benefit of the group, so that they actually get somewhere. Submission is for everyone involved. It's not just for wives. It's not just for the group. Everyone is involved. I know, I know our prides and our, our self-absorbed little egos want to scream in rage that we are not to submit or subject or subordinate ourselves to anyone else. But unfortunately for you, church, you all liked and subscribed to being apprentices to Jesus. Unfortunately, you, you joined into a relationship with a God that necessitates sub submission, subjugation, and subordination. You joined a heavenly family, family dedicated to obedience. Congratulations. And here's the crazy thing about submission. We want to submit to good leaders. Believe it or not, we want to submit. You hear something like, wives, submit to your husbands, and you immediately need your kick, react against it. Or group members or, or subordinates submit to your leaders, and we immediately kick back against it. But if you were a follower of a good leader, you would want to submit to that leader. And if your partner is constantly subordinating his or her own personal desires for your safety, your benefit, your good, you would be like, this is great. I will follow you anywhere because I know you have my best interest at hand. We rant and rave and, and rail against bad leaders because we don't want, and we definitely don't want a verse in the Bible to tell us to submit to our leaders because they are often bad leaders, right? But we willingly, we very happily submit to good leaders. This is why it's easy for the Apostle Paul to argue, wives submit to your husbands. Because then he spends eight verses outlining what husbands or leaders, regardless of gender, should be doing. Furthermore, specifically within the covenant of a Christian marriage, if both parties are constantly involved and, and practicing a state of submitting to your partner, your own subordinating, subjecting your own personal benefit, your own will for the good of the group, do you realize, do you realize how incredibly rare it would be to come to a decision head where the leader or the head needs to make the final decision? If you both are constantly looking for the benefit of the group, 
and not your own personal will, desire, want, how rare it would be to come to a place where, okay, well, I guess you got to make the final the call. Incredibly rare. And then, this is the kicker, if you are in a Christian marriage, which means you're in some sort of weird, mysterious, Trinitarian covenant with God, guess who actually makes the final call? Yeah? yeah? <laughs> if both parties in the relationship are actively practicing submission to the other, and they're, they're shopping for a house, and one wants a, a red cottage style house, and the other wants a, a blue mid-century modern house, uh, the husband doesn't say, honey, Ephesians 5.22, <laughs> wives submit to your husbands. Yeah. To which, of course, the wife would say, honey, Ephesians 5.25, you're supposed to die for me. <laughs> We're getting the blue house. <laughs> no. Both parties are going to actively be participating in submission. Therefore, they're actively going to be seeking to understand the wants and needs of their partner. And furthermore, they're going to choose the 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 benefit of the greater group, the benefit of the couple, the benefit of the family above their own personal red or blue desires. Which probably means they're going to get the really cool three bed, two bath right next door to me <laughs> so that I can have the best, most mature neighbors of all time. And I can build my empire. <laughs> so I ask you, church, what's your relationship with submission? How well-conditioned is your obedience muscle. And leaders, how good at you are laying down your own personal benefit for the group you lead, whether you're a manager, a parent, a CEO, or a pastor. Church, I want to ask you to sit and dwell in that difficult obligation that we all have, leaders or group members, to submission in your lives. And what that creates in your life, what your relationship is to it. Whether you're a leader or a follower, you're called to be an active engager in submission. And I hope that you can meditate on that week. Specifically, I want to point out that as long as I've worked here, coming up on four years now, Paul has not taken a raise. Inflation is at a 40-year high. Typical raise is 2 to 3%. It's eight and a half right now. And pastor, who has led you for the past 25 years, specifically the last two years through the insanity of the pandemic, hasn't taken that. So I ask you, we expect great things and exceptional behavior from our leaders. No doubt, that's expected and we should. But do you reward the good leaders that you have? You send e emails when you get angry. But do you thank, reward, and properly appreciate the good leaders that are before you trying their hardest on your behalf? We don't celebrate people who do their job. But I think it's natural, and I think that's perfectly natural and okay. But I would argue that being a good leader is not natural. It's not commonplace, and it's certainly not the normal. <clears throat> Amen? We are in a desperate drought of good leadership right now. And therefore, we as the group should act accordingly when we find one. Amen? Therefore, I would argue that not rewarding our good leaders means that we're not really upholding our part of the social contract. Church, this text has been used and abused and misinterpreted again and again and again against the women in our lives alone, let alone in the histories and the lineages of their ancestors. Our, each and every one of us, male or female, have been affected by this through the generations, through literal centuries. But we can stop it. 
right here, right now. This text no longer has to be a bludgeon against our mothers and our grandmothers and our sisters and our daughters. But stop using it to subjugate women, half the population, and let's start reading it as a commentary on power and pride and submission and leadership. Let's start using it as an outline for how we are to live with one another, with our leaders and our followers. Let us practice submission as leaders or followers, which is to say, let us love one another better because we can, and we can start right here, right now, by laying down our lives, our prides, our self-absorbed little egos for the benefit of the kingdom. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we are engaged in this relationship with you, but it's, it's kind of bogged down by this religion around you that says that we're going to be great, we're going to be happy if we just, I don't know, follow Jesus, follow God, believe, believe in him. But the trick to, to following you is that you are headed straight for the cross. You are headed straight to lay down your life for us. And if we're following you, that means we're next in line. And we don't practice that at all. We use your word to subjugate and abuse and manipulate and control and coerce other people to doing what we want. And your whole plan is to, to love, which is to lay down our own lives for those around us. Forgive us first, primarily, for the sins that we have brought to your word that was intended to bring life. And then lead us, God. We want to follow good leaders because you are the best possible leader. Every decision you make is for our benefit. Teach us how to follow a king and a God and a leader like that, like you. And teach us as we learn to follow you, how to be leaders like you. Laying down our own lives for those of us around us. Truly love you. In Jesus' name we pray.